Now let's continue on with the theme of the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that God will help us, we can trust in him, we can look to him and everything, don't look to the world and what is out there, because what God has to offer is so much greater. Okay? Now, let's come over here to Psalm 54. Psalm 54. And as you go through some of these psalms and study the psalms, especially when you pray, it would be a good idea to open the psalms so you can read them and help you be able to begin your prayer to God. And that will really connect you, God's spirit in you, God's word that you're reading, and what you're praying, all together work together for good. Psalm 54 and verse 1, save me, O God. And that's where salvation comes from. By your name and vindicate me by your might. Yes, indeed. Now, this could have very well been a prayer of Jesus, a prophetic prayer of what he would have prayed. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth, for strangers have risen up against me, and violent men seek after my soul. They have not set God before them. Selah. Think on that. Yes. And these are all things that we need to, to have in our hearts and our minds so that we can have the strength when difficult times come and we turn to God and we look to God. Okay? Verse 4. Behold, God is my helper. Now underline that. God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my soul. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? He shall reward evil to my enemies. Now, think about all the things that are going to happen as recorded in prophecy in the book of Revelation to the enemies, to those who hate God, to Satan the devil, to the demons, to the elite, to their armies, to their governments. God is going to take care of them. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he delivered me out of all trouble. Circle that. Not just a trouble or some troubles, but all trouble. And my eyes have seen its desire upon my enemies. Now we'll be able to see that the same way. Come over here to Psalm 57. And here's how we are to pray to God and look to God. This is why the word of God is so great and wonderful because it conveys to us spiritually what God has put into it so that we can be encouraged and we can be inspired so we can have that connection with God and look to him for everything. Verse 1, Be gracious unto me, O God, be gracious unto me, for my soul trusts in you. Not our own devices, not other people, but in God. Yea, in the shadow of your wings. Now, when you're in the shadow of God's protection, people can't see that protection, but you experience it. I will make my refuge until these great troubles pass by. And they will. You look at all the things 
that you have gone through. And they will all pass by. Verse 2. I will cry to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. Now think on this. God the Father and Jesus Christ have a specific purpose for each and every one that he calls. And we won't realize the fullness of that until the resurrection, when we're all on the sea of glass. Then we will know. Because God is a God of purpose. And purpose for each one of us individually. Okay. He shall send from heaven and save me. He rebukes him who would swallow me up. Selah. He does that. I can tell you that by personal experience. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. And that's what we need. God's mercy and God's truth. In everything that we do. See, that's why we pray and we study and we fast and we draw close to God. Okay? Come down here to verse 7. Talks about how the enemies were after him. But in spite of all of that, verse 7, notice, my heart is fixed. Not going to change. It is fixed, it is established, and strong. My heart is fixed, O oh God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. That's something. See? Just think what it's going to be like at the resurrection when we're all on the same sea of glass. We're going to sing and bring praises to God. What is that going to be like? Huh? All of us with all the saints and all the patriarchs and all the apostles and all of our brethren down through the centuries. All of us gathered together and singing praise to God. Remember what it says there in Revelation 19? We say, hallelujah. And it says that three times. Okay. Awake, my glory, awake, harp and lyre. I myself will awake the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the people. I will sing of, your, of you among the nations, for your steadfast mercy is great, even unto the heavens, and your truth to the clouds. Be exalted above the heavens, O God, and let your glory be above all the earth. Now think what that's going to be like during the millennium and what we're going to be doing during the millennium to bring these things about. Now, let's come to Psalm 37. Here's a tremendous psalm with praises, with promises, and all of those all mixed in together. Psalm 37. And also, how then we could have the right attitude in the middle of all of this and have confidence and know and trust and believe. All right? Psalm 37 and verse 1. Do not fret yourself because of evildoers. No, don't look at what they do and they're prospering as we found in Psalm 73. And do not be envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herbs. Okay? Don't have anything to do with the way of the world. Now verse 3. Trust 
in the Lord. Okay? That's something. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cherish faithfulness. Now you see how that all works together? If you cherish it, if you love it, if you love God, there it is. Delight yourself in the Lord. Now that's quite a statement. Be happy, be thankful, be grateful for God's love, for God's grace, for God's intervention in your life, for understanding his word, for him giving us of his spirit. See? Delight yourself in the Lord. Now notice, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Won't hold back any good thing. And a lot of this comes at the resurrection. Think of that. Commit your way unto him like we just read. My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed. Unmovable. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will bring it to pass. God will make it happen. We can count on it because God cannot lie and his word is true. And he shall bring forth your righteousness like the light and your judgment like the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. See? Notice again. A little warning. Notice how this is all intermixed in this tremendous psalm here. Do not fret yourself because of him who prospers in his way, because of him who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret yourself. Three times. Don't be frustrated. It leads only to evil. God is going to take care of it. Evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Think about that. All right? Drop down here to verse 11. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. We're going to bring peace to the whole world. Okay? Now that's something. All right? Come over here to verse 16. Now here's what we need to understand. Because if you are in contact with God, with prayer and study, and fasting and yielding to him, studying his word, and you look out and you see the world and all of these people prospering, Remember this verse, verse 16. Better is the little that a righteous man has than the riches of many wicked. Okay. Now let's look at some other verses down here. Verse 22. Here it is again. These are promises. And God can't lie. And we can rely on them and be inspired and be encouraged and be uplifted. Verse 22. For those blessed of him shall inherit the earth and those cursed of him shall be cut off. Okay. Now, here's what we are to do. And this is the whole theme of unleavened bread. Verse 27, depart from evil. And during Feast of Unleavened Bread, during these seven days, leaven is a type of sin. Pride, arrogance, selfishness, sinfulness, vanity, and all of that. Okay? 
Verse 27, depart from evil and do good and live forevermore. That's the goal, eternal life. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the earth and dwell in it forever. There it is again. How many times does he say, we'll inherit the earth? Now think about that. It tells us in Romans, the eighth chapter, that if we are heirs, we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. the whole earth. All right? That's quite a thing. The, verse 23, the steps of a good man are made firm by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Now that's something. That's true. And he gives the next verse. And I can say with this, I can identify with it. And a lot of us, because there are a lot of gray hairs out there. Okay? Verse 25, I have been young. Oh, we look at back when we were young and think, wow. Now we look at ourselves and we think, wow. And now I am old. Seeing everything that goes on. So he says, yet. I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children begging bread. Okay. All the day long he deals graciously and lends and his children are blessed. Depart from evil and do good. That's the whole thing here. Okay. And live forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. He is with us to help us, to guide us, see, regardless of how dire the circumstances may appear. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the earth and dwell in it forever. Wow. He says this four or five times. Inherit the earth. That's a statement indeed. Boy. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart, and none of his steps shall slide. Okay? Now, let's come down here to verse. Verse 34. These are really some psalms, brother. The very words of God given through his servants, through David, through some of the priests so that we can read them and we can understand them and we can have hope in them and we can look to the plan and purpose of God that he will carry it out because God is true and God is love and God cannot lie and these things will take place and it's going to be a wonderful glorious day when they do now let's continue on. Here again, he says it again, verse 34. Wait on the Lord and keep his way. Never give up, even though it's tough. And he shall exalt you to inherit the earth. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. Okay. Now let's come to the last two verses in this Psalm. So this whole psalm is really a wonderful thing. And all the psalms that we're covering are these things to inspire us, to help us, 
to give us confidence so that we can go forward. Because remember, Jesus said that the times ahead of us are going to be the worst that has never been this bad since the beginning of the world. So we need God's spirit. We need God's help. We need his strength. We need his word. Okay. Verse 38. But sinners shall be destroyed together. Ha! Huh. Like a fire, right? The prosperity of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. For he is their strength in time of trouble. And we won't face it. Jesus said we would. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they take refuge in him. See all of that? See how good that is? Okay. Now let's turn to Psalm 70. Now, one of the reasons why David was a man after God's heart is because he understood that without God, he was nothing. And he understood that everything came from God. That's why when the sin of Bathsheba occurred, God really had to correct David. Because look at all these psalms that have been put together telling about the close relationship with God. And then he slipped and let that happen. And that's another whole subject here, but Psalm 70, okay? Psalm of David. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Sometimes we need help immediately. But God is there to do it. See? Let them be ashamed and confounded, those who seek after my soul. Let them be turned backward and put to confusion, those who desire my hurt. As everyone was after him, and even rebellion by his his offspring to see who would be the successor to David when he died. Let them be turned back for a reward of their shame. Those who say, aha, aha, now we've got them. Okay. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you, and let those who love your salvation Say without ending, let God be magnified. All comes from God. See? But I am poor and needy, make haste unto me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer, O Lord. Wait no longer. Well, that's quite a thing. Now we could go through other psalms that cover more of these things. All right. Let's come to Isaiah. Isaiah 41. And here we have the same thing. Over and over and over again that God is there. That he will help us. That he will be with us. That he will lead us that he will guide us. Now think about this. Think about this from this point of view. God has given his Holy Spirit to us, right? And Jesus said, the one who loves me, which we do, we love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all of our being. 
the one who loves me will keep my word. And the Father will send the Holy Spirit and we, that is God the Father in Christ, will make our abode or dwelling place with him individually from God. So we have God the Father and Jesus Christ in us, in our minds, united with the spirit of man that God gave us at conception. And now we're being created in the likeness and image of God to be spirit beings as God is God. That's why even in troubles and difficulties, we need to rejoice. We need to think on how much God has done for us and called us and taught us and given us all of these things that he has given freely. Okay? Psalm 41. Let's pick it up in verse 8. Psalm 41, verse 8. But you, Israel, now just put your name there whatever it is, okay? Are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, were the called, the chosen, and the faithful. The seed of Abraham, my friend, because everything in the Bible comes from Abraham in Genesis 15, as we have covered. See? So we're all connected with that. All right? Abraham, my friend, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called you from its uttermost parts, I have said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Now think of that individually to you because you put your name there. Okay. Do not fear, for I am with you. Even in the most stark and trying times. Do not be dismayed. No. Oh. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, because we need to fight against Satan, fight against the world, and overcome self. Yea, I will help you spiritually, mentally, emotionally, through his word, through his truth through circumstances. Yea, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Then he talks about the wicked. Day's going to come. They're not going to be around anymore. That's the day we're looking forward to. Okay. Verse 13. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Now that is really tremendous. And we know there's nothing going to hold us back. Okay? Do not fear, you worm Jacob and men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Now let's come to Romans, the eighth chapter. Okay. Romans 8. Because this is quite a thing we can count on, we can look to, we can understand and realize that God is with us and that there is nothing, nothing, that is going to separate us 
from God because we fix our heart so that we're always right with God through Christ. Chapter 8. You know where I'm going. You know what I'm going to read because this is the theme of the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay? Romans 8, verse 28. And here it is. Here's how Paul put it. And of course, he was familiar with all the Psalms. And he had a close relationship with God. He had visions from God. God revealed to him tremendous things for the New Testament that we need to understand because these are the words of eternal life. Verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. See, that's why it's important. Every day, pray about the first greatest commandment, loving God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and that he will help us to do that and lead us to do that. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And as we read, God is working out his purpose for each one of us. Okay? Because those whom he did foreknow, that's us. That is before the resurrection. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his own son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay. Now notice, God looks forward to the finished product because he knows it's going to be. Now what, whom he has predestined these he's also called, and whom he called, these he also justified through the sacrifice of Christ, through the forgiveness of sin, through the shed blood and everything about the life and death and resurrection of Christ. Whom he is justified, these he also glorified, prophetic, perfect, yet to come. Okay? We have a temporary glory now with the Spirit of God in us, but when we're resurrected, we'll have the fullness of glory. So he says, what shall we say to these things? Because these are awesome things indeed. If God is for us, who can be against us? Like Jesus said, Fear him who can take life and cast you into Gehenna. But don't fear those who are against you. Okay? Verse 32, he who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all. How shall he not also grant us all things together with him. And who shall bring an accusation against the elect of God? God is the one who justifies. Doesn't matter what they say about us. Doesn't matter what they think about us. It doesn't make one bit of difference. Because God is the one who justifies. God is the one who saves. God is the one who's going to help. Okay. Who is the one that condemns? It is Christ who died, but rather who is raised again, who is even now at the right hand of God and who is making intercession for us. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? Now think about what Paul went through. Second Corinthians, the 11th chapter. 
all those things, all the tribulations, all the trials, all the beatings, all of the everything that he had to go through, okay? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? All of those are terrible things to contemplate. But if our hearts are fixed, we'll be through it. God will help us. He's promised that. According as it is written, for your sake we're killed all the day long, and we are reckoned as sheep for the slaughter. In all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's quite a thing. God loves us. Christ loves us. They want us in the kingdom. That's why they have these holy days. That's why they've given us his spirit. Okay? For I am persuaded that neither death, no, because you'll be resurrected, nor life. Nothing in this life is going to take us away from God. Nor angels. No demons are going to get after us and take us down nor principalities, nor powers, that is, those things of Satan, the devil, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So remember, Jesus said, I will help you. I will never leave you or forsake you. That's the meaning of this day, the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread.